It is one of the most important occasions in India's long and troubled journey with defense production. Prime Minister Narendra Modi today flagged off and inaugurated what is essentially the Indian private sector's first ever manufacturing facility for military aircraft. That's right. This picture here may be just one picture in one frame, but the Prime Minister of India, along with his Spanish counterpart, has basically lifted the veil of a facility that goes down in history as breaking the monopoly of India's state-owned institutions like HAL and the defense public sector undertakings. And for the first time, the private sector, which has been yearning for a chance to build weapons, aircraft, and hardware for the Indian military, has finally got that chance. Take a look at this report of the big milestone inauguration of the Indian C-295 factory. A milestone for Make in India in defense and aerospace. A flagship beacon for the future of defense production in India. And the country's first private sector facility building aircraft for the military. Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his visiting Spanish counterpart presided over the inauguration of the final assembly line of the Made in India Airbus C-295 military transport aircraft. A joint venture between Tata and the European aerospace giant. Under this contract, while Airbus will deliver 16 fully built aircraft from its Spanish facility, the remaining 40 will be built here in Vadodara, with full aircraft rolling out of this line inaugurated by the leaders of the two countries. We are C-295 transport aircraft ke production ki factory ka shubharam kar rahe hai. Aaj, October mahine mein hi, ye factory ab aircraft ke production ke liye tayyar hai. In 2026, the first C-295 manufactured in India will produce by this plant in Badodra. This aircraft, it is a symbol of the Spanish and European aeronautical industry. In addition to contributing to modernizing India's defense capabilities, it will also drive technological development, particularly for the state of Gujarat, India's leading manufacturing hub. Providing a major boost to Atmanirbhar Bharat, the inauguration comes three years after the Indian Air Force signed up for the C-295 to replace legacy British Avro transport aircraft in service. Inaugural landing of the Indian Air Force aircraft, C-295. Of the 16 to be delivered from Spain, six have already been delivered to the Indian Air Force. A C-295 recently made a debut landing in public at the new airport in Navi Mumbai as well. In service with 36 countries and their militaries, the C-295 is a versatile tactical transport aircraft capable of rapid operations and can carry 73 fully armed troops or 48 special forces paratroopers. It can be converted for all manner of operations including medical evacuation, humanitarian relief operations, surveillance missions and even low altitude delivery in hostile airspace. The inauguration in Vadodara comes days after the demise of Ratan Tata, under whose leadership the Tata Group's foray into defence took place. It is a historic moment not only for the Tata Group, but also for India. And this project embraces the true Atmanirbhar vision of our Honourable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji. Made in India aircraft where the aircraft parts manufacturing as well as the full assembly of the aircraft and the integration is being done for the first time in India by private sector. The Make in India TC295 program has become an industrial benchmark which is aligned to the Prime Minister Modi's vision of self-reliance or Atma Nirbharat Bharat. 
With the C-295 program, not only Tata and Airbus will assemble 40 aircraft here in this state-of-the-art final assembly in Vadodara, but we will also manufacture all sections and 13,000 of the total of 14,000 detailed parts of the aircraft here in India. The first Made in India C-295 will roll out of the Vadodara facility in September 2026 and production here will ramp up to deliver 40 aircraft to the Indian Air Force by August 2031. India has become the largest customer for the C-295 with the acquisition of 56 aircraft in total. The C-295 Make in India program will produce more than 85% structural and final assembly of 40 aircraft along with the manufacturing of 13,000 detailed parts in India for which 21 special processes have been certified and 37 India-based suppliers both from the private and public sectors have been enlisted. This means a huge number of aerospace manufacturing jobs and high skill set employment. Beyond the 56 aircraft for the Indian Air Force, the facility is certain to receive orders from the Indian Navy and internal security agencies, in addition to civil aviation carriers. With Brajesh Doshi in Vadodara, Gujarat, Bureau Report, India Today. And a little over a year ago, in fact, in July 2023, I happened to be in Spain where the first 16 of these aircraft are being built by Airbus at its own facility in Spain and delivering them to the Indian Air Force. Six of those aircraft have already been delivered. Another 10 will be coming and the remaining 40 will be built at this facility that's been opened today by Prime Minister Modi. Take a look at this ground report where I got up close with the first C-295 for the Indian Air Force. This is July last year. We're here in Sevilla in Spain at an Airbus assembly facility to see something that Indian journalists are seeing for the first time. That is the first C-295 aircraft for the Indian Air Force. This aircraft is the first one that's been built by Airbus, a part of 16 such aircraft that are going to be built at this sprawling facility and delivered very soon. This particular aircraft is going to be delivered in just the next few uh, weeks to the Indian Air Force, after which uh, 15 more such aircraft will be built at this precise facility uh, in Sevilla, in Spain, for delivery to the Indian Air Force. So I'm walking around the aircraft. It's a first look at C-295 number one for, for the Indian Air Force. It's going to be fulfilling a long-standing need that's been felt by the Indian Air Force for over a decade. It's a, it was a requirement to replace the old vintage British HS-748 Avro aircraft. I'm walking around the first C-295 now uh, under the tail area of this aircraft. The important thing about the C-295, remember, uh, isn't the fact that the first 16 are going to be built uh, here in Spain. And uh, here on India today, you know, we've gotten first access to the aircraft uh, also because something very important is taking place back in India. 16 of these aircraft are going to be built here in Spain, but the other 40, as many of you will know if you've been watching India today and my show, is that the other 40 are going to be built in Vadodara at a Tata facility. These aircraft will have their technology transferred by Airbus to their partner Tata and then Tata becomes the first Indian private sector company to build military aircraft for the Indian Armed Forces. The Indian Air Force operates aircraft like the AN-32, the Avros of course are being phased out, but these aircraft are going to be fulfilling an extremely crucial need. Remember the Air Force operates aircraft uh, for many different things but its transport aircraft are crucial because India is geographically large, we've got all kinds of terrain. This particular aircraft is capable of landing on unprepared surfaces. It's designed for operations of high altitude areas uh, which is a particularly difficult thing uh, you know in, in, in aviation because of the, uh, the thin atmosphere and the various other challenges and remember India has important crucial air bases at high altitude whether it is Leh, whether it is Thois, the world's highest military airfield uh, 
uh, which is Dalat Beg only, uh, is also in uh, is in is also in India. Uh, and the aircraft of this kind has been proven to be able to operate uh, from such forbidding locations. Now, 56 aircraft of this kind uh, will be built for the Indian Air Force. That number might go up because the Indian Air Force, apart from uh, replacing its old Avros, also has to replace over 100 AN-32 uh, aircraft. And AN-32s, remember, are of Ukrainian origin great aircraft, they're workhorses uh, of the Indian Air Force, but they are also aging and will need to be replaced by new generation transport aircraft of the kind that the C-295 is. Whether or not that happens remains to be seen, but with an Indian factory churning out these aircraft uh, between now and 2031, uh, it stands to reason that, uh, uh, you know, th this very same aircraft should actually replace the AN-32. Uh, apart from the Indian Air Force's own requirement, uh, this is a very versatile aircraft in the sense it's not just a transport aircraft. Look at it as uh, a bit of a Swiss Army knife. Uh, it depends on what you put into it. You can sling on a maritime radar, it becomes a maritime patrol aircraft, uh, very much like what the Indian Navy and the Indian Coast Guard are looking at. About 15 aircraft in total is what they're looking at. Uh, it, can, uh, it can be used for land surveillance if you put on the right kind of sensor. The border security force is looking for that kind of capability. Uh, you know, if you add passenger seats, you can convert it into a short-haul regional airliner. India needs many hundreds of those kind of things. Uh, if you, uh, you know, add anti-submarine sensors and uh, a torpedo capability, it can become an anti-submarine aircraft. If you put a radar on its back, it can become an airborne early warning platform. Uh, so what I mean is uh, it's very modular. It depends on what you want to do with the aircraft and it can be used for all these different kinds of purposes. So if you have a production line for the C-295 in India, uh, it becomes something very useful for India's different and very disparate needs across different terrains. So it's historic in all kinds of ways because the C-295 uh, not only fulfills all these needs but gives India an aircraft manufacturing capability in the private sector which has never been there before. Airbus has had a long relationship with India, but this is for the first time that such an ambitious and landmark project is being executed. 56 of these aircraft being built 100%, almost 100% in India by the end of the entire program. In Sevilla, Spain, this is Shiv Arur for India Today. So six aircraft have already been delivered. The first India-made aircraft, the first India-made C-295 will be delivered to the Indian Air Force sometime in 2026. 40 of them will be built between 2026 and 2031. It's going to be a facility that builds a huge number of aircraft. But where does the C-295 actually fit into the Indian Air Force's transport aircraft fleet? Let's tell you first what the Indian Air Force operates from low to high, let's see. Donier is an, a German, a very famous German, uh, uh, German aircraft, small transport aircraft, has been licensed, built by Hindustan Aeronautics Limited for many years. The Indian Air Force currently operates about 58 of these little aircraft that conduct all manner of missions. Then you've got the Avro HS-748. These are vintage British aircraft, and these are the ones that are now being replaced by the Airbus C-295. These are British aircraft, also licensed, built since the 70s by HAL, uh, 57 of them are being replaced right now by the C-295. The aircraft that the Indian Air Force operates in larger numbers than any other in the transport sphere is the Ukrainian AN-32. It's a Soviet origin aircraft built in Ukraine, upgraded in Ukraine. It's a tactical airlifter. Over a hundred of those currently in service. Many of them are of an improved, upgraded version. Just above that, you get the C-295. That's where the C-295 actually plugs in. It replaces the Avro and perhaps the AN-32 going forward. It's a Spanish aircraft. Airbus is a European conglomerate made in Spain, but also now, as we just showed you that last report, going to be made here in India. In service, there are six, 50 more to be delivered for a total of 56, but there will be more, and I'll tell you in a moment. Next comes the C-130J Super Hercules. It's an iconic tactical air transporter built and uh, the origin is, of course, the United States of America. It's a medium airlifter. India currently has 12. The Indian Air Force operates two squadrons of these, one in Hindon on the outskirts of Delhi and the other in the eastern sector. Then you've got the Illusion IL-76, very recognizable by its uh, silhouette. It's also a Soviet 
uh, origin behemoth. India currently operates about 17 of these heavy lift transport aircraft. And finally, the C-17 Globemaster III, which is the newest of the heavy lifts, also an American icon as far as wartime and combat airlift is concerned. It's a strategic airlifter. Now let me tell you about what the C-295 is going to do in India. In the Indian Air Force, 56 of them will finally be inducted. The missions include airlift, logistics, troop transport, medevac, humanitarian relief, and surveillance, special operations using paratroopers, low altitude supply, that kind of thing. The Indian Navy has planned for nine of these aircraft. That number might go up. The missions include maritime surveillance, medium range maritime surveillance, anti-submarine warfare, and also anti-ship warfare because it can carry anti-ship missiles. The Indian Coast Guard has asked for something called a multi-mission maritime aircraft or triple MA, six of those based on the C-295 in which the planned missions will include obviously coastal surveillance in addition to search and rescue, oil spill response and possible other utilities. Above and beyond these tri-service uses by the uh, Air Force, Navy and, and, uh, and the uh, Air Force and uh, Navy and Coast Guard, you've also got something called the DRDO Airbus C-295 Airborne Early Warning Aircraft. An unspecified number of these are likely to be built where you take the C-295 aircraft, you sling on an India-built uh, 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 multi-mission radar on the back of it like the Netra aircraft that you've already seen uh, in service with India, and they become very, very capable airborne early warning and also command and control aircraft. Then you've got the border security force and possibly even the Indian Army looking at unspecified numbers of these aircraft uh, for land surveillance, troop and cargo transport, and any other missions. And last but not least, we have to remember that beyond the military, beyond the paramilitary, beyond the security agencies, there are civil operators. The C-295 can just as easily, as I said in my re ground report from Spain, be, uh, you know, the inside can be hollowed out and it can be converted into a passenger jet, a very comfortable passenger jet. And India needs short-haul aircraft for that next leap in aviation and connectivity in the country under the Udan scheme as well. And these aircraft could very easily be built in Vadodara and supplied to Indian civil carriers and civil operators for that kind of thing. So the C-295 is going to be much bigger than just the 56 that are being built currently for the Indian Air Force. Very privileged to be joined now by former chief of the Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal RKS Badoria, uh, you know, who's been instrumental in the Make in India thrust uh, within the military for many years. He's someone who has, uh, you know, who, who has given a great deal of momentum and impetus uh, to Made in India projects, including the C-295. Air Chief Badoria, thank you very much for being with me. Thanks, sir. Your opening comments on this milestone occasion, the Prime Minister inaugurating the final assembly line of the C-295 in India, sir. The uh, C-295 uh, production facility set up uh, by Tata's and Airbus, this is uh, the first military aircraft production being set up in, in the, on the transport side. And I think it is a, it's a huge game changer as far as our industry is concerned. Uh, be because uh, as you're aware, uh, uh, HAL has been uh, uh, at the core of our uh, development, uh, ADA and HAL in terms of fighters, in terms of helicopters, in terms of uh, all the trainer aircraft so far. But on the military aircraft side and on the private sector involvement side, this is the first contract with the private sector and uh, first in the, on the transport aircraft side. So it, it, it's hugely important. And for the industry, uh, for uh, evolution of our, our aviation sector, uh, this is, I think, a game changer. Can you give us a sense, uh, Air Chief, uh, what the C-295 can do better than what it will be replacing in the Indian Air Force and what the Air Force currently already operates? What will the Air Force be able to do now that it perhaps couldn't do before? No, this was planned as Avro replacement. We had 56 Avros. Those were to be replaced. As you are aware, uh, you know, Avros uh, were inducted in 60s. Uh, so they were end of life. Uh, as a replacement for Avros, it is hugely capable. In fact, it, its capability goes much beyond what it is replacing. And and in fact, it, it is uh, uh, capability-wise somewhere close to AN-32. 
So overall, as far as the roads are concerned, uh, across the board, all transport aircraft roads, uh, it will be able to uh, undertake very effectively, uh, be it, uh, you know, transportation of troops uh, for, for uh, moving load for supplies, for supplies in forward areas, for para drops, uh, for, for supply drops, everything, all the roads, uh, the, the ambulance role, uh, the communication role, uh, mm. ever was being used hugely uh, for, for that role. So overall, I think uh, in terms of what it brings in terms of capability to the Indian Air Force, it's much beyond what it was replacing. So yeah. it, it would be hugely beneficial for the Air Force operationally. The, uh, you know, I'm sure, Air Chief, that the Indian Air Force prefers to operate India-built aircraft rather than, you know, getting imported stuff because of the many complexities involved. But, uh, you know, I I'm sure our viewers would like to hear that from you. Am I right that the Indian Air Force would much prefer to use and operate something that's made here in India? Well, that is absolutely uh, uh, a totally different ballgame. Uh, when we operate aircraft built in India, uh, the entire maintenance chain uh, becomes much easier. Mm. Uh, the kind of support that is available for, uh, towards, let us say, spare supplies, towards support in terms of uh, servicing, towards support in terms of major overall subsequently. And uh, most importantly, when it is built in India, when you want to upgrade, when you want to add features, when you want to uh, improve some aspects of its performance, uh, uh, in, in, in any form, be it in avionics upgrade, be it in uh, some of the kind of loads that you want to carry, some of the roads that you want to uh, bring in, it is hugely beneficial. Mm. Uh, and and uh, this is not even, even talking about uh, the, the uh, importance of it to the industry itself. For the industry, uh, a huge project like this, uh, uh, when they come into the supply chain for Indian Air Force and for 295 for their global supply chain, that is very beneficial. So yeah. overall, for the industry, it is extremely good. And for Indian Air Force, of course, it is hugely beneficial. What about the spillover effects? You know, will Indian industry benefit from this? This is, after all, sir, uh, uh, you know, an assembly facility, uh, you know, where uh, lots of different parts will be put together here. Many of those parts are being manufactured, of course, uh, in, uh, in uh, Telangana as well. But will there be some benefits for the industry in terms of know-how, not just how to build, but how to develop? Uh, yes, uh, uh, for that, I would say this is the first step uh, where you set up a, a production facility like this. Uh, 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 there are a huge uh, number of accessories and, and as, uh, sub assemblies that get manufactured. So the capability of the industry in terms of manufacturing sub assemblies and uh, doing the integration final assemblies and manufacturing uh, many of the subsystems, uh, that capability comes up. Uh, there is a uh, knock-on effect on the design capability. There is a lot of knowledge that comes into the industry. Mm. Uh, but uh, you're right, from D&D uh, aspects, you have to go much beyond. Uh, and uh, this forms the baseline capability to be able to do the next step of designing your own or upgrading this aircraft itself. For example, yeah, I would yeah. expect Tata now to uh, go into a, a joint kind of uh, development work with the Airbus uh, to get to the next generation or the next upgraded version of 295, which can handle, for example, uh, more short fuel operations, a more powerful engine, a more uh, capable high altitude uh, operation, something like close to AN32. Yeah, so that kind yeah, of upgrade, yeah. Tata can become a joint development partner. Subsequently, uh, what you are talking about, our ability to design or transport aircraft per se, uh, this capability of the industry would, uh, would form the basis on which uh, that kind of design and development uh, would take place. So for the industry and for our design and development, I think this is a very big first major step. And it's it's also useful to remind ourselves and to tell our viewers, uh, Air Chief, that this, this Vadodara facility where the C-295 is being built now for the Air Force is the first, the very first private sector uh, facility in the country building military aircraft. It has never happened before. Uh, this is basically a facility that comes up in a country where Hindustan Aeronautics Limited has had virtually a 100% monopoly on local manufacture and assembly of aircraft for the Indian Air Force. It has enjoyed, uh, you know, a complete domination of that particular market. And now, with this facility coming up and hopefully more, HAL has competition. How do you see that? Uh, 
very rightly so. Uh, and and uh, we have to realize uh, when you want to grow in the aviation uh, uh, you know, uh, field, private sector involvement and the involvement of startups, involvement of MSMEs is the key. Yeah. So you, you cannot depend only on HL and the DPSUs uh, to, to grow to the next level uh, that we want to go. Uh, it is so. It is true for all. In fact, even for fighters, for the next generation aircraft that we are looking at, the private sector involvement has to go up. Therefore, this is a very, very landmark uh, event, uh, yes. uh, wherein a contract with the private sector is done with Tata's, and uh, the production will take place entirely in private sector. Uh, if we have to look at efficiencies, cost reduction, uh, increase of, uh, let's say, production rate, uh, increased involvement of MSMEs and uh, across the board private sector, the uh, a very, very coordinated effort of DPSUs and private sector MSMEs, that is the key to uh, our growth in the future. Mm, mm. Therefore, this not only gives the options to the Air Force, for the industry, uh, it is a very, very essential step. And I hope uh, a similar kind of uh, steps get taken into our other fields of production in the on the aviation yes. side, be it fighters aircraft, uh, be it uh, helicopters, be it, uh, uh, you know, uh, trainer aircraft the involvement of private sector needs to go up. And I would, uh, in the form of, let's say, either SPV, for example, for AMCA, or uh, similar kind of uh, arrangements that can be done along with private sectors. Air Chief, could this, you know, could a facility like this, the one that the Prime Minister has inaugurated, and you talked about how you hope to see Tata and Airbus now, uh, you know, work together, not just on uh, the, the manufacture and assembly of the aircraft, but co-developed, you know, conduct actual... Uh, aerospace research and development for either an upgraded version of the C-295 or maybe even some kind of a, a, a newer transport aircraft for the Indian Air Force going forward for its next generation of operations. That would mean uh, India's appetite for aerospace scientists, engineers, you know, very, very top-level, high-skill-set jobs uh, will be of a, uh, of a major premium in this country. Does this have the potential, I dare ask, to reverse in some manner the brain drain that this country has been experiencing for such a long time. Engineers, aerospace experts, uh, uh, you, uh, you know, uh, scientists, etc. won't have to go abroad for those high skill jobs. They can stay here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not only reverse the brain drain, uh, it gives uh, 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 very, very uh, big challenges to our new generation that is coming up of yeah. engineers from IITs and all the engineering colleges to come into, uh, uh, you know, the real high-end technology and design and development. Uh, because it is challenges like this. When you, when you have something new to design, uh, something big to design, something big to uh, deliver to the nation, to our different services, those are the challenges that need to be thrown up to these uh, youngsters who come into this field. Uh, this wasn't there uh, earlier in this manner, especially in the DND field and R and D field. And and I think uh, the, this landscape is changing. And this will be the biggest change uh, that this private sector involvement will uh, bring in. And that's why I'm repeating. I hope a similar kind of thing happens uh, into other fields, wherein huge uh, uh, you know amount of private sector participation, uh, increased participation of MSMEs and startups into our R and D and DND setup, along with DPSUs and, and DRDO. We we need to change this entire uh, and, and that's how we will grow in this aviation field it's yeah. very complex and and uh, apart from uh, looking at what we have achieved on the airframe and other sites we need to look at the engines which is uh, which has been a sad story so far and very i think true. that's yeah. uh, again an area where we need to uh, you know uh, look at private sector and public private partnership maybe to uh, uh, succeed in that area Fi Final question, uh, Air Chief Badoria, is, uh, you know, India has a vast market. You know, we've just told our viewers about how beyond the 56 C295s that will be built, uh, that will be delivered and built in India, uh, uh, there's going to be a, a much larger demand for these aircraft within the country from the other services, from the civil sector, etc. Uh, but beyond that, does this facility and facilities like this sort of plug India into a global aerospace supply chain? Because that's where the future really lies. India is already... Uh, quite advanced in aerostructures, manufacturing subsystems and components for all the big aerospace companies in the world. But does a facility like this only address the Indian market or does India gain the benefit from being part of a global supply chain? Because that's where we are competing with countries like China. 
it is a big opportunity when, when you start uh, manufacturing aircraft like this uh, the effort must be to not only manufacture for example for uh, our current uh, uh, order it is 56 aircraft but whatever manufacturing facility gets uh, set up for some assemblies for other uh, components etc which are being mm. made here they must form a part of the supply chain of uh, uh, airbus uh, for the global supply chain also uh, it will be a stepping stone for the industry to grow as such and all our future developments uh, of aircraft requirement in this zone in, in the 295 zone or, or a little higher zone where this aircraft can be modified upwards both in capability in load and in uh, uh, performance uh, that should happen uh, within the country so so the the supply chain uh, and getting into global supply chain is the key unless uh, the numbers increase for our industry you cannot become very efficient and low cost uh, I think yeah. for the industry, this will be, again, a very major step to get into the global supply chain. Off and on, for small components, uh, our industry has been doing, for example, some doors uh, uh, for, uh, and some other parts uh, that mm. are, uh, are, are uh, industry, private sector, has been in, uh, increasingly getting into the supply chain. But this changes the game. You are getting into a major way uh, in the supply chain. And I think a similar effect we should try on a, on a, on the Airbus fleet, for example, on the 320s, 321. If you're ordering 1200 aircraft, our industry must keep stepping up into the supply chain more and more. And that's how the industrial growth will take place in this sector. The sector is very complex. It is time consuming. Yeah. It is very high uh, uh, investment. And, and uh, the moment you have uh, these export capabilities, I think that is the key. Reverses the brain drain, more jobs, more uh, for the economy, more for the military, uh, uh, you know, more optimized uh, hardware for the Indian Air Force, for defense needs, uh, high-skilled jobs stay in the country, a bigger ecosystem as far as engineering jobs and aerospace jobs is concerned. It goes beyond just something that flies. It's something that has the potential to be a game-changer for India in the field of self-reliance in defense and beyond in a globalized world. Air Chief Marshal RKS Badoria, always a pleasure, sir. Thank you very much for speaking to India today. News just coming in. Disengagement that began a couple of days ago between the Indian and Chinese armies in northern Ladakh friction points of Depsang and the southern Ladakh friction point of Demchok is nearly complete. The process is expected to be completed. We are hearing latest by tomorrow, which would mean a possible resumption of patrolling in these two stubborn friction points possibly even before Diwali. Let's go across to India today's Shivani Sharma bringing us the latest on this. Shivani, uh, for three days now, in fact, four days now, uh, the disengagement process has been on in Depsang and Demchok. You've just returned from Ladakh as well. Uh, this is good news, which means that the first layer of that pullback is nearly complete, possibly paving the way for the resumption of patrolling, which could happen before Diwali. Jeff, the timeline that was being set for this engagement from Demchok and Depsang Plains was a, was a, was a week-long uh, deadline. And it started on Wednesday, remember, on 23rd of October when uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi was uh, shaking hands with President Xi Jinping at the sidelines of BRICS summit in Kazan. And that was the day when the first tent was dismantled. And exactly after a week, that means... This Wednesday, it's being expected that the patrolling can resume. That would be on the occasion of Diwali. Uh, the resumption of the first patrolling will be there in Demchok and Depsang. And mm. for that, the disengagement is almost completed. That's what the defense sources have indicated, that uh, the disengagement process is in the final phase. The cross-verification goes on now. Cross-verification will happen from both the sides and then... A formal acknowledgement of a complete disengagement will be made and thereafter the first patrol will resume and, and we were telling our viewers ship that so the patrolling will be in a coordinated manner to avoid any kind of clashes and confrontations but the timeline that was set is being well met and uh, in next two days the patrolling will resume after the disengagement is completely done.
Okay, this is good news. Remember, the, always a note of caution when it comes to India and China. There's a very long way to go. There's no reason for exuberance. The very, very first fractional layer of a troop pullback has taken place, is taking place. The resumption of patrolling means some few inches of forward movement, which is always welcome when it comes to India and China. We'll keep you posted and we'll continue to give you a realistic assessment of how this story actually unfolds. Don't believe any exaggerations when it comes to Eastern Ladakh. Now you remember those viral images during Ganesh Puja of the Chief Justice of India hosting Prime Minister Modi for a puja at the Chief Justice of India's home? Well, amidst a storm of criticism then and now from the opposition targeting Chief Justice D.Y. Chandrachud, who is now the outgoing Chief Justice of India, he has now defended his meeting with Prime Minister Modi during that Ganesh Puja. The CJI clarified that such meetings are routine and focus on discussing judicial infrastructure rather than judicial verdicts. He described these interactions as a part of a robust dialogue between the judiciary and the executive. Well, this comes after Prime Minister Modi attended that Ganesh Puja held at the Chief Justice's residence in Delhi last month. The opposition had exploded in anger and has continued to attack, questioning the negative message and symbolism being sent out to the public. The Congress also raised concerns about the exclusivity of the invitation to the Prime Minister. The Sharad Pawar camp added that the Chief Justice of India may be feeling guilty and is attempting to justify his actions amidst the ongoing criticism. Chief Justice of India has slammed, rightly so, the doubters who are creating all kinds of doubts and making all kinds of aspersions on the post of the CGI, constitutional position, by saying that because PM attended Ganesh Arati at CGI's residence, it was a deal being stuck between them. This is the most unwholesome, illogical and ridiculous comment and the CGI has called it out. The fact of the matter is that Many Chief Justices, Chief Justice of India, often meet Prime Minister, meet the government heads, meet the Chief Ministers. This is how cordial relations should exist. Legislature, judiciary, executive. Who are all the same? Clear line. Rehna Checks and balances. I am saying clear line. And a clear line. This is the logo. You know, politics is a, is a game of perception. You know, if Chief Justice of India is inviting Prime Minister of the country, what message they want to give to this country? And I want to ask him a lot. It was a puja function. You are inviting uh, Nadeen Modi. Why are you not inviting opposition leaders? They belong to this country. They are important leaders of the country. If you are uh, performing puja, you can invite opposition leaders also. But you are not inviting. You are inviting only prime ministers. So definitely, people will raise questions. That is the reason, not only Congress party. Even a, a, a common man may raise this question that why Chief Justice is inviting Prime Minister. If you have to discuss anything regarding Supreme Court, regarding infrastructure, regarding mm. any uh, administrative problems, then you can talk to law minister. Chief Justice of India appears to be feeling a bit of a, a sense of guilt that he is trying to now explain and try to tell the people of this country, 145 crore people, that, well, how the Constitution is to be followed and how the theory of separation of power and coordination among the three wings of the uh, uh, government, yes. uh, the executive, the legislature and judiciary have to interact or to keep distance. I don't think there is a need for him after 75 years of the constitutional exercise now, with so many decisions having come as to what should be the relationship between these three wings inter se. And I think what he is suggesting today is only trying to mitigate the error that he has committed. A big story today, the government is expected, we're hearing this from our sources, the government is expected to begin a long-delayed census, an official survey of the country's population in 2025 after a four-year delay owing to the COVID pandemic. The census, the national census, which assesses India's population, typically conducted every 10 years to update the National Population Register, was scheduled for 2021, but had to be postponed due to the COVID pandemic. Now the census cycle is also 
expected to change because of this delay. Following the census, the delimitation of Lok Sabha seats, that is, spreading them around, increasing the number of Lok Sabha seats probably will commence. And this exercise is likely to be completed by 2028, according to sources. Well, this big development comes amidst demands from several opposition parties for, remember, a caste census. However, the government has not yet made a decision and details of the census process on what exactly will be asked of respondents is yet to be made public. So we don't know if a national caste census will be part of the larger population census. Sources also say the next year's census may also survey subsects within the general and SCST categories. Meanwhile, the opposition India bloc has hit out at the Modi government, alleging that Modi's refusal on a caste census was a betrayal of OBCs. Remember, Modi himself is an OBC. <laughs> और अभी ये खबर आया मोदी जी ने खुद सरकार ने उनका सरकार ने ये इतना बड़ा आरक्षण मुंह ले दिए इस बार जाती है जनना करना करने वाले नहीं इसमें एक बहुत बड़ी चीज ये है आरएसएस और टीडीपी और जेडीयू अभी क्या कहेंगे और उनका वो लोगों का साथ रहेंगे और सत्ता के लिए मोदी का ये आरक्षण डिसीजन का साथ है there is no consensus report. There is only a socio-economic survey report by the Backward Class Commission. And uh, that, uh, I'm not sure if it is going to be placed before the cabinet as an additional subject. But there is, absolutely, there is no caste census as such, right? We don't have the power to do caste census, whether it's in devolution of taxes, whether it is uh, right allocation in the 16th Finance Commission, or whether it is in uh, delimitation process. Please consider how we have ensured better governance, how we have absorbed more migration, how we are propelling the nation economically. Uh, whatever, let, let us have a conversation. Why, what prevented uh, the Modi government from having a census uh, on schedule? When development is going on, there are many parts of the society that are back. अलग अलग रीजन से होते हैं हम किसी एक रीजन दो रीजन के लिए नहीं होते उसके लिए जरूरी है हम के पता करें कि कौन सा समाज पिछला पिछड़ा रह गया कौन से समाज को जो है दिक्कतें आ रहे हैं कौन से समाज में जो हम लोग एक्सेस टू एजुकेशन एक्सेस टू गवर्नमेंट जॉब्स एक्सेस टू लैंड तो ये सब नहीं मिल रहा है तो जो तो उन जब ये बातें सामने आएंगी तो आने वाले गवर्नमेंट्स को पॉलिसीज और प्रोग्राम्स और टारगेटेड डेवलपमेंट करने के लिए सुविधा होगी इसीलिए हमारा डिमांड है कास्ट सेंसस का भाजपा क्लियर करे सेंसर करवाएगी या कास्ट सेंसस करवाएगी Let's go straight across to India today is Piyush Mishra who's been tracking this story. Piyush, uh, you know, this could become a very big developing story in the run-up to 2025 with the national census uh, likely to be conducted at that time. No official confirmation just yet, but the idea of a caste census being part of it is likely to become a major flashpoint. In fact, the opposition has already begun talking about it. Any sense of whether the, uh, that is the thought process of the government right now? Well, she will like, rightly mention that uh, the topic of caste censor has become uh, the most interesting one because the opposition political parties have started uh, cautioning government over this. Remember that today in the morning itself, uh, when this uh, uh, when the news reports came that the government is likely to conduct a uh, census uh, next year, at the time itself, uh, the uh, Congress party had asked uh, the government of conducting a uh, caste census. And if it is not uh, doing so, then it is going to betray uh, the OBC communities, this is what the Congress party had alleged. Um, but at the mm. same time, it is also important to note that uh, the news reports have suggested and various uh, government sources have told us that uh, government is likely to, to do the census next year. Uh, as of now, the caste census uh, is not in the mind of government and uh, in fact, they have not taken a decision on okay. uh, conducting caste uh, uh, census. Uh, uh, not only the opposition political parties shift, there are various uh, allied partners of NDA like LJP and JDU. Even they are That's of the right. view that caste census should take place. In fact, JDU has gone on to say that uh, 
नेशन वाइड कास्ट सेंसस शुड हैपन अर्लियर इट वाज डन इन बिहार वेयर इट हैज एक्चुअली हेल्प्ड इन स्ट्रेंथनिंग द वीकर सेक्शन ऑफ द सोसाइटी एंड एलजेपी इज आल्सो सीइंग द सेम थिंग वेयर दे आर सेइंग दैट इट शुड हैपन बट द डेटा शुड नॉट बी मेड Piyush, thanks very much for giving us that update. We'll track it. Uh, hopefully, an official word of confirmation from the government uh, about for 2025 being the year when it will be conducted will also take place. But right now, remember the big focus and spotlight is on the looming elections in Maharashtra and Jharkhand. It was a big day of nominations in Maharashtra today. Chief Minister Eknath Shinde, Deputy Chief Minister Ajit Pawar, and Sharad Pawar's grandson Yogendra Pawar. filed their nominations in high profile ceremonies today the seat sharing deadlock however continues on a few unannounced seats in both sides of the alliance camp the mahayuti as well as the aghadi take a look the battle for maharashtra intensifies many big names filed nominations on monday chief minister eknath shinde deputy chief minister ajit pawar and Sharad Pawar's grandson Yogendra Pawar filed their nominations from Kopri Pachpakhari and Baramati constituencies Shinde held a massive road show in Thane ahead of his nomination a sea of supporters gathered in support of the chief minister Shinde's family offered prayers before filing his nomination The chief minister is facing Shiv Sena UBT candidate Kedar Dighe, the nephew of Shinde's political mentor Anand Dighe. Shinde has been representing the seat since its formation in 2009. Mukhya Mantri ji, record voto se aayenge, apne hi purane record ko wo todenge. Thana mein tino seate, do Shiv Sena, ek BJP, ye prachanda mato se aayegi. Here you can see that how the Ladki Ban Yojana uh, women are present over here, and Maharashtra CM Ekna Shinde receiving bouquets from there. Wherever Maharashtra CM Ekna Shinde is passing, there is thousands of people who are gathered over here, and here you can clearly see that how the show of strength is going on. In Baramati, it's Pawar versus Pawar. Deputy Chief Minister and MCP Chief Ajit Pawar filed his nomination from the Baramati Assembly seat. दादा का वादा जो आपने देखा है महाराष्ट्र में अभी तक जो डेवलपमेंट दादा ने किए बारामती में डेवलपमेंट किए ये है दादा का वादा अभी तक जो दादा ने प्रॉमिस किया है वो 100 परसेंट एग्जीक्यूट किया है ये है दादा का वादा अजीत पवार चैलेंजर एनसीपी शरद पवार कैंडिडेट युगेंद्र पवार फाइल हिज नॉमिनेशन इन द प्रेजेंस ऑफ शरद पवार एंड सुप्रिया सोले it's the larger cause that all these young people are coming with and wanting to make a difference it's again i reiterate myself that it's not a personal fight at all it is an ideological fight about policies which we are against 36 year old architect turned lawyer and daughter of ncp leader nawab malik sana malik filed her nomination accompanied by her father Sana is contesting from Anushakti Nagar constituency as the Ajit Pawar led NCP's nominee. She is facing Fahad Ahmed, husband of actor Swara Bhaskar, fighting on an NCP SP ticket. मेरे पिताजी ने इधर पिछले दो बार विधायक के तौर पे काम किया है और इस पूरे क्षेत्र को विकास और नचर किया गया है इधर क्षेत्र में पिछले सात सालों में लगातार मैं अनुशक्ति नगर के लोगों के बीच में काम कर रही हूँ आप लोगों को दिख रहा होगा कि मेरा जनता के अंदर क्या कनेक्ट है मीन वाइल सीट शेयरिंग टॉक्स इन बोथ द महायुति एंड महाविकास अघाड़ी है मुंबई ब्यूरो रिपोर्ट इंडिया टूडे सो रैप ऑन फाइव लाइफ थैंक्स सो मच फॉर वॉचिंग